An MP is targeted by China, and the Prime Minister is back on the hot seat. I'm Eric Sorensen, sitting in for Mercedes Stevenson. Welcome to the West Block. Justin Trudeau says he didn't know that a Conservative MP and his family faced alleged threats from China back in 2021, even though a CSIS report spelled it all out. The MP at the center of the controversy wants some answers. And prosecuting Russia's Vladimir Putin for war crimes. Can it be done? I sit down with the chief prosecutor for the International Criminal Court. Another explosive revelation with China's alleged interference in Canada erupted last week. Conservative MP Michael Chong was informed he and his family were targeted by a Chinese diplomat in Toronto. And he says the federal government failed to act. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau insists he only learned about it through media reports and that CSIS didn't share its assessment with him. As I said on Wednesday to Michael Chong and to Canadians, information uh, on, on, uh, uh, that was released on Monday through the media never made it to me, to my office, or to the minister at the time. Uh, going forward, such information would absolutely have to be uh, raised to the highest political level. Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie summoned China's ambassador to Canada to explain. She says the government is still weighing its options over whether it will expel the accused diplomat. We're assessing the consequences that uh, we'll be facing in case of diplomatic expulsion, because there will be consequences. I think it's important that Canadians know what we've learned from the two Michael experience is that, of course, China and the PRC will take action. These interests, including economic in interests, consular interests, and also uh, diplomatic interests, Joining us now to talk about this is the man at the center of the latest controversy, Conservative MP Michael Chong. Thank you for being here with us. Um, so the Prime Minister said he wasn't informed, but from now on he wants something like this, your case, to be kicked upstairs to him. Are you satisfied with that response? Uh, no, I'm not, and here's why. It's clear that the July 2021 intelligence assessment that CSIS produced was sent to departments and to the Privy Council office, his department. Uh, and so what's so astounding is that he has set up the architecture of government, uh, the machinery of government, as they say in the PCO, in such a way as to not be informed about these critical national security threats. This is part of a broader pattern of this government not treating seriously national security. We've, we all remember the national security breaches at the Winnipeg lab. Uh, we rem there are countless other national security breaches that we have heard of in recent years. And yet the Prime Minister, who is alone responsible for national security, who alone is responsible, ultimately responsible for national security, and alone responsible for the machinery of government, in other words, how the government's architecture set up its, its organizational structure and how information flows, the Prime Minister set the structure up in such a way as to not be informed by... Uh, by his intelligence experts about these national security threats. Now, he's indicated that's changed, but he's been prime minister for almost eight years. Mm -hmm. I think this might be excusable eight months into a new government, but there's no excuse for this eight years in. Tell us what you know now about how you were a target and in what way. Yeah, well, we know two things. We know first uh, from the July 2021 assessment that an officer in the Ministry of State Security in the PRC was gathering information to target my family in the PRC in order to target me <clears throat> on the floor of the House of Commons and put pressure on me to change my position on democracy and human rights. We also know that other MPs were being targeted, we don't know who they are, by uh, the Ministry of State Security in the PRC. The second thing we know is that a PRC diplomat accredited by the Government of Canada in Toronto, Mr. Wei Zhou, was working also to gather information about my family in order to uh, put pressure uh, on me. So those are the two facts we know. Uh, and this only goes back to 2021. You were not, as far as you know, a target like as far back as 2019? 
Oh, ab absolutely. What's not new information is that the PRC targets the families of Canadians uh, in the PRC. That's not new information. We have known that for years. My case is not unique. We've heard countless stories in recent years of Canadians being targeted by the PRC here on Canadian soil by using their family back home to coerce and intimidate Canadians here. Uh, there's been numerous reports, there's been numerous parliamentary reports highlighting this, uh, reports in the media, uh, reports from security services, not just here in Canada, but elsewhere. We've, we've heard of the police, the illegal police stations the PRC has set up here in Canada, part of a campaign to intimidate uh, members of the diaspora community. So this is not new information. What is new is that the Canadian government knew two years ago that a PRC diplomat was working to gather information to target my family and did nothing about it. They never told me about it, nor did they take any action to, uh, with respect to this diplomat. The other, the other thing that's new is that we found out that despite the government of Canada knowing broadly, despite the fact that CISA sent this July 2021 intelligence assessment, broadly within the senior levels of the government to various departments and to the Privy Council office. Despite that, what's new is that the Prime Minister and Public Safety Minister set things up so that they weren't informed. And that's astounding to think that that's the case. Well, the, um, uh, the intelligence services, they make assessments. They make hundreds of them a day, the Prime Minister said. Do you feel yours was consequential enough that you should have been informed sooner? Well, I'm not sure it's accurate to say they make hundreds of intelligence assessments a day. Intelligence assessment is a document. Um, I'm not, I, I find it hard language, to believe. Perhaps. Yeah, I find it hard to believe that hundreds. But I, I think the fact that he didn't know is his responsibility. When a new government is formed, the government, the prime minister is responsible for setting up the flows mm -hmm. of information in the government, for responsible for setting up uh, the machinery of government, as they say. And so clearly he set the government up in a way uh, so that he would not be told about serious national security threats. And it's part of a broader pattern. We've, we've, we've seen the establishment of illegal police stations that apparently still continue to operate here in Canada by the PRC. We've seen breaches, national security breaches at the Winnipeg National Microbiology Laboratory. We've seen targeting of MPs in all these cases. It's clear that the government doesn't treat these threats seriously and, and, and frankly, doesn't seem to want to know about these things. You had cut off uh, contact with your family in Hong Kong because of your position in government here. So you've had concerns of this type for a long, long time. Were you shaken though when you heard? I was shaken. Uh, I was profoundly disappointed, but I was also shaken. Not that family in the PRC was being targeted by PRC authorities. You know, as I said earlier, this is not new information. What I was deeply shook up about is that the Canadian government wasn't protecting me and my family, wasn't taking action to protect me and my family and I just it was deeply it was deeply disconcerting to think that the federal government isn't protecting not just me and other MPs but Canadians more broadly against these security threats it really really shook me up that that we're, we're standing naked in the wind so to speak exposed to these threats do you know if uh, in the end people in your family back in Hong Kong were in some way investigated unfortunately I don't uh, out of an abundance of caution years ago I decided not to communicate with them in order to in order to uh, protect them. So, you know, I, I my case is one case. There are cases across the country of Canadians and diaspora communities, the Persian community, the Chinese community that are being targeted targeted on Canadian soil by agents working on behalf of these regimes. We've heard countless stories. And what I suddenly realized is how vulnerable these Canadians feel when they go to their federal government to say, we're being targeted, we feel threatened, and they hear nothing back. Let me, let me ask you about this. The, uh, the Foreign Affairs Minister, Melanie Jolie, uh, has called in the Chinese ambassador. She and the government are considering uh, whether or not to expel a diplomat, but she says there will be consequences. Do you think that the consequences that could come from a big country like China, are they worth taking in your case, in this case? Well, what I found astounding about her testimony is that she enumerated uh, the concerns of consequences that the government is considering, beginning with economic. She's, what I was astounded in that testimony was that the foreign minister essentially said to the PRC in Beijing that our 
your strongest leverage point is economic consequences because she enumerated the list beginning with economic consequences. I, I thought that was I thought that was very concerning that a foreign minister of a G7 country would telegraph to an authoritarian state uh, the strongest leverage you have over us is economic. Uh, you know, I that that was quite uh, astounding to hear would, in public testimony. Would an expulsion though make a difference if China's just going to carry on with what it does anyway, brings in another diplomat to do its bidding? Um, you then get the consequences without actually making any difference in terms of how China conducts itself. Well, I think, unfortunately, we got to this place because the government previously hasn't taken action to expel, to expel diplomats from authoritarian states like the PRC or Russia who have engaged in coercive and intimidation activities here on Canadian soil. If you look at other democratic allies, they have expelled many Russian and PRC diplomats, many. I'll just give you a couple examples. Since the war began in Ukraine, uh, over 400 Russian diplomats have been expelled by European and American governments. Most recently, Germany expelled mm -hmm. 20 Russian diplomats for engaging in these coercive activities on their soil. The Canadian government hasn't expelled a single Russian diplomat. And the same thing goes for the PRC. They haven't expelled PRC diplomats for intimidating Canadians here for establishing these illegal police stations, for example, for, for doing so many other things that cross the diplomatic line. And I think the fact that they haven't makes emboldens the PRC to in, in conduct even more of these activities on Canadian soil. So I think they need to send a clear message and expel this diplomat. And I just want to say also that the, the West Bloc contacted Minister Jolie's office to ask her to appear on the show. She was unavailable though I am sure you will be having many more questions for her in the days ahead. Michael Chong, thank you for coming in. Thank you. Up next, the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court wants to put Russian President Vladimir Putin on trial for war crimes in Ukraine. We'll ask him how he's going to do that. The Ukrainian president has accused Russia of committing more than 6,000 war crimes in April alone. Volodymyr Zelensky was speaking last week in The Hague, where the International Criminal Court is based. If you look at any war, any, any war of aggression in the history, they all have one thing in common. The perpetrators of the war didn't believe they would have to stand to answer for what they did. In March, the ICC issued an arrest warrant for the Russian president and another Russian official, accusing them of abducting and deporting Ukrainian children. It was a bold move, and the chief prosecutor who made it joins us now. Welcome, Karim Khan. Thank you for having me. Um, president Zelensky believes Vladimir Putin someday will be before the courts. You obviously believe it because you've laid charges, but how do you bring that about given that the Kremlin is not going to give him up? Well, our job is to follow the evidence, and uh, we did that. We submitted uh, applications for warrants that were independently reviewed by judges, and they've issued warrants. And I think now it requires uh, stamina, it requires the international community to make sure that the law is rendered potent. And, um, you know, I think what we have to take courage, people thought Milosevic or Karadic or Miladic or President Charles Taylor would never be held accountable and history has shown that they were brought before courts and um, that possibility is an active one and uh, people remain in jeopardy until they answer charges. Zelensky wants a separate tribunal in addition to what the ICC is doing um, because he feels the court lacks jurisdiction on crimes of aggression. Can you explain that and, and whether or not you agree with him? Well, we have the crime of aggression. It was negotiated in Kampala in Uganda. Um, it's been activated, but there are some jurisdictional impediments that uh, the 123 state parties that make up the ICC put in place. And I think the difficulty is uh, one should always apply the law against others that one is willing to apply to oneself. And so my basic responsibility is to apply the law we've got, which is genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes. We are collecting evidence of aggression. But uh, I think as the warrants that have been issued by the judges show, we're moving with speed, with, uh, we're accelerating our action. We're trying to make sure that the law is relevant not to us as lawyers or judges, but relevant to the people that need it the most. And we're doing that in Ukraine and we're doing it in other parts of the world. The, the charges are um, aimed primarily, it seems at the moment, uh, at the de deportation of children. Um, we have witnessed these atrocities of buildings being blown up, civilians being killed. 
You were in Bucha. Were you moved by that? And from all of what you've seen when you were on the ground in Ukraine, will we see more charges? Well, I, I said when I was in Bucha, behind St. Andrew's Church with uh, body bags in front of me, that Ukraine is a crime scene. I, I've been to Boryadenka and Kharkiv and Kherson and other locations. And one sees a whole variety of devastation. One hears allegations of sexual or gender-based violence, allegations of torture, of prisons of war, uh, and of course, uh, attacks against civilian objects. And I think one has to have the uh, stamina to investigate it. It requires uh, prioritization of areas. And I'm going to keep going to the best of my ability with the excellent work of the men and women of my office, with the partnerships we're building with Ukraine and uh, Canada and many other states to make sure that the law is felt at this moment of need with greater impact than perhaps people feel uh, thought was possible. If, um, if the last year has shown us anything, it is that Putin has a solid grip on power in, in Russia. If you can't get him into court, could that diminish the view of the ICC's work? Well, the point is, we, are, we don't start firstly with targets. We started with the evidence, and the evidence led us to the targets. I, I think I go back to what I've said earlier, that people that feel uh, the law is impotent or this is a fool's errand should remember that there was a time nobody thought they could be in Nuremberg trial, nobody thought uh, Milosevic or Karadic or Maladic or Charles Taylor would see the inside of a courtroom, and they did. Uh, look at the Cambodia courts. There's no statute of limitations for war crimes. Something has been commenced by the independent judges of the court and triggered by my office that really isn't going to just vanish and disappear. Uh, there is a presumption of innocence, but people that are innocent should answer the allegations. But uh, if one flees and if one seeks to simply dispute jurisdiction, the allegation doesn't go away. The best way is if there's an answer, if you've got it wrong, challenges in the courtroom, and uh, I'm open to that as well. You know, you, you have a case against Putin, but if you never do get him in court, does some, is there something to be gained from bringing this out against Putin, the attention that is coming to this, the attention that the ICC gets in putting this in front of the world to see that there is inter international justice necessary and maybe there's more that other countries all need to do to make justice uh, happen? I think partnerships are key. We don't have a police force. We require states to cooperate. We need to build a consensus in which the law is viewed as everybody's property. Everybody has a stake in it. We're not thinking about Ukraine or the Ukrainians or the Rohingya or people in the Democratic Republic of Congo or Sudan. We should think of people as our brothers and sisters and they're in need. They're feeling scared. They're feeling terrorized. They're feeling insecure. And don't we have a duty collectively? to make sure the law has an impact upon them. And I think, uh, you know, as long as we've got the stamina to not lose focus, I think history tends to show that uh, there can be justice. But if we get distracted, if we deprioritize it, uh, then we can erode confidence in the rule of law. And I think when we have countries with tactical nuclear missiles that are t discussing using them, and we have the kinds of crimes we've seen in so many other parts of the world, if we're true that every human life matters equally, this is a time for our collective reawakening. It's a time for countries like Canada, there's a great supporter of the ICC, very good support from the Foreign Minister and the Minister of Justice and the people of Canada. Uh, they've had very important roles in the ICC, but we need to make sure that everybody around the world realize this is a defining moment for us, because if we think we will have many countless opportunities to fulfill the promise of never again, um, that's a fool's assumption because we have the means to destroy the planet many times over. And so we should feel that this is the opportunity to step up and apply the law with greater vigor everywhere in the world. Ukraine is an important test bed to make sure if we've got the will, the collective will to do that. Do the charges just being laid close in on Putin? Um, the idea that there are 123 member states, if he were to travel to them with these charges outstanding, could he face being arrested? Or do you fear that there are countries that he could arrive and they just don't have the guts to arrest the president of Russia? Well, countries are not monolithic. There's a whole spectrum of interests, pressure points that could arise. But as far as international law is concerned, all the state parties have a responsibility uh, under the Rome Statute, which created the ICC, to implement judicial orders. And there is a judicial order. It's not my order. It's not the order of Karim Khan, the prosecutor. It's an order that has a judicial quality given by independent judges. And I think um, that remains, uh, an individual remains in jeopardy as long as there's a judicial order that is not answered. Um, and, um, you know, then it, the rest is down to states. But I do think we have to do our job. A domestic police officer will not fail to lay a charge 
because he feels there's a fugitive who's escaped jurisdiction. You lay the charge and then you start using the other instruments available, whether it's extradition or mutual legal assistance or other types of activity to make sure that individual is brought before the court with the presumption of innocence so judges can test whether or not there is a case to answer and whether or not the prosecution approved it beyond reasonable doubt. I say clearly we've got a strong case. You know, at one time you've defended some notorious characters, Charles Taylor in Liberia. Um, some have seen you as a controversial figure. You know, you have turned prosecutor, but you've also been on the defense side. I mean, what is your motivation at this point? And, and do you like being a prosecutor more than a defender in a case of this sort? Well, I love justice. I started out uh, as a prosecutor in England and Wales. I was a senior Crown prosecutor and then had the uh, great blessing to work at the Yugoslav Tribunal. I was the first member of the English Bar there. I worked uh, under a number of prosecutors, including uh, the great Canadian Louise Arbour. And then I left and I went to private practice. I did defence cases and represented victims. And in all those parts, there is value in being a servant of justice, even though one may be representing a different party. But I feel very honoured and humbled to have this particular responsibility at this time to be the prosecutor of the ICC. I think um, it's not easy, but we have to collectively stand up together because um, it's worth fighting for and it's worth making the system work as well as it can. It is a distinct and rare pleasure to have you here in Canada. So Karim Khan, thank you for coming in to talk to us. Thank you for having me. Up next, an historic weekend for Charles III. But do Canadians and Indigenous peoples want a new king? Now for one last thing. Canada has a new king. And for many Canadians, it raises the question, do we really want a king? One year ago, just months before he ascended to the throne, Charles was in Canada and met with Indigenous leaders about reconciliation, without much fanfare. Times have changed. Crowds voiced their welcome to the King and his lovely Queen. The last time Canada had a visit from a King, in 1939, George VI crisscrossed the country to great flourish. The memorial speaks to the world of Canada's heart. He unveiled the new National War Memorial, and the Queen laid the cornerstone for the new Supreme Court building. So central then was the monarchy to the identity of Canada in building this nation. On a month-long tour, the royals paid a brief roadside visit with Indigenous chiefs. It wasn't seen as a major event. Through Queen Elizabeth's reign, there was often pomp and pageantry, but always there was unfinished business when it came to the Crown's relationship with Indigenous peoples. Which brings us back to the new king. His visit a year ago recognized the need to do more. On the eve of his coronation, King Charles met once more with indigenous leaders, signaling that reconciliation may be the most important duty a monarch has ever had in this country. Canada is still a nation building and evolving, and the king, it seems, still has a role to play. That's our show for today. Thanks for watching. I'm Eric Sorensen. See you next Sunday.